Could, is it possible to turn the lights down a little bit at all? Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, both to uh, Richard and to Jonathan for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, I've been out in the UK now for four or five years or so, um, and it's always a kind of strange thing to come back. When, you, when you've been away for a while, the English do look rather strange. However, um, also very familiar, and that sort of familiarity for me breeds a sense of solidarity, and I'm very grateful for that, and I really look forward to speaking with as many of you as possible over the next couple of days um, and hearing um, what you have to say. I'm going to talk today for about 45 minutes, and I want to talk to you um, about uh, Takuma Nakahira's work, Circulation, Date, Place, Events, a work that was installed um, at the Paris Biennale uh, in 1971. Oops. If we go the right way, we can find it. There it is. Now, I make no apologies for addressing a work that is now nearly 50 years old. First, I think it's an immensely significant artwork. In fact, I would say um, one of the most important photo artworks uh, of the early 1970s, and I think it has a lot to reveal to us. Second, it relates, I think, very explicitly to the topic of this conference, photography as interface. And in fact, one of my sort of broad arguments here is that Nakahira constructs a very sort of complex photographic uh, interface that opens the work up in all kinds of ways to a kind of questioning and a discussion about the relationship between uh, the photographer, uh, the work, uh, and the world. Third, I think circulation tells us a lot about our digital present. It is, in a sense, an artwork that has found its critical moment. And just to give you an indication of this, this is a reinstallation of circulation at the Art Institute of Chicago um, earlier this year. It's kind of work of forensic uh, archaeology in which they kind of put the work together again. It doesn't entirely surprise me that they did this after Nakahira's death. Um, and perhaps by the time you get to the end of my paper, you'll have a sense of what I think Nakahira would have thought of this. My presentation to you today is also part of a wider project I'm engaged in, which might be positioned under the headline, Photography Has Always Been Digital. Circulation, as we shall see, is also very revealing in relation to that claim. A second broadly methodological concern here is the question of periodization. What I think is so interesting about the current moment, for all kinds of reasons, some of which Jonathan touched on, this kind of more intensely political moment that we're in above all, is the pressure, I think, that's beginning to appear again in photography to think about historical transition and photography's place in this. This has, I think, for a long while been deeply unfashionable, not least uh, in American graduate schools, but I want to retain a commitment to the explanation of historical change of photography and the hermeneutics of depth that this entails, and I'll come back to this topic at the end of the lecture. Now, we're fortunate that we know quite a lot um, about uh, the installation of Nakahira's circulation at the Paris Biennale in October 1971. He wrote a good deal about the project over the next couple of years. I think it was a very important project for him, and it was a significant moment for what he described as his artistic methodology. Nakahira was one of four Japanese artists commissioned to make an intervention at the Biennale uh, that year. And he was invited by his friend and erstwhile provoke collaborator Takehiko Okada. And I'm going to come back and speak a little bit later on about the significance of Provoke magazine to Nakahira. Actually, there seems to have been considerable arm twisting involved. Nakahira was a reluctant visitor to Paris suffering what he described at the time as, quote, a lack of confidence and indifference, a result of a creative slump after publication of his first photo book for a language to come in November 1970. And again, I'm going to fold back and talk about that book during the course of this lecture. Moreover, the Biennale itself was a disappointing experience uh, for Nakahira, or rather not so much disappointing as in some sense calamitous. It was, he later wrote, not only an indication of contemporary art's futility and depressing emptiness, but rather a symptom of a far deeper creative crisis. And I just want to read you something that Nakahira wrote shortly after attending the Paris Biennale because it sets up the significance of this artwork very well. 
He wrote, yet what seized me in that moment, the moment he arrived at the Biennale, was not the level of quality of the individual artworks, but a perverse astonishment that came from the recognition that many contemporary artists had confronted the same unexpectedly deep labyrinth posed by the absolute impossibility of expression and creation in precisely the present moment, an age which forces us to ask, what does it mean to express something? What does it mean to create something in this era today? Really kind of great set of questions that he poses here in 1971. I sometimes feel that my whole life has been kind of lived in the shadow of these kinds of questions. Now, Nakahira's portentous commentary suggests, I think, a profound rupture in his understanding of the possibilities of photography. These were by no means unusual sentiments for artists at this time. You hear them elsewhere. But I'm really struck by Nakahira's clarity of expression. We could spend some time talking about this, but instead I want to proceed pretty quickly with just two suppositions. First, that this crisis has something to do with the distribution of images. In particular, the vast penetration of the social fabric during the 1960s, and not least in Japan, by media and commercial images. This is the kind of so-called rise um, of uh, the spectacular society, the society of the spectacle uh, that Guy Debord wrote about in his book on the subject in 1967. And second, as is so evidently clear from this quotation, there's a sense of crisis in the continuity of history itself, a sense that history was becoming harder to narrate. Both of these, I think, have to do with an overloading of perception, and it's this sense of overloading or blockage that circulation is conceived to overcome. Circulation for Nakahira is a new construct. It's a new method, as he kept saying, a new means of intervening, not just in the game of art, but also in the movement of history to create what we might describe as a new scopic regime. As we know from his writings, Nakahira began a process of making what he called an observational diary, travelling around Paris, taking up to 200 photographs a day and printing them at night to display the next morning. I haven't done darkroom work for many years now, but a friend of mine recently reminded me what incredibly hard work that was, photographing during the day, printing at night, so he can pin them up, or glue them up, actually, as he did on the boards uh, the next morning. And there are all kinds of stories about the kind of amount of stimulants he was using to kind of keep himself awake um, during this process. He managed this for about a week, he took about 1,500 photographs in all. My guess would be that he actually displays about six or 700 of those photographs. And he then entered into a confrontation with the Biennale authorities, and he tore down the work. So he, the, the work was torn down after about seven days. And that confrontation was quite complex. He managed to politicize it. Um, but it was fundamentally to do with the way that this work was sprawling uh, all over the exhibition hall. Visitors were thus confronted by an ever-evolving visual storyboard, at once systematic in its chronology, but also highly contingent in its formation and presentation. As you can see, the work sprawls. Images are torn off the wall. They were torn off the wall by the Biennale authorities. Uh, photographs curl, and they pile up on the floor. The installation shots suggest something both deliberate and casual, an intelligent disorder. The individual photographs speak mainly of time and circulative flow of information. Of people. Of images. Of transportation. of liquids, of foodstuffs, all things that circulate uh, and move around within the urban environment. And meaning is made less by juxtaposition than by agglomeration. There's a process here bringing things together. Rarely is any image decisive on its own. Now I want to return in a couple of minutes to what exactly circulation is, because I don't think it's by any means obvious. But first I want to summarise fairly quickly, I have to say, how Nika Nakahira got to this point and also what he himself wrote about circulation. 
I think one of the things that's becoming very clear to us now, uh, particularly actually in recent research, is how highly theoretically aware Japanese uh, photography was during the 1960s, far more so, I think, than anything in Western Europe. And the presuppositions that Nakahira articulated in relation to this work are very important. I think they're almost part of the work itself. So I think it's uh, significant that we need to be kind of clear about this. Now, Nakahira studied languages, particularly Spanish, um, at a university in Tokyo, and he began work uh, when he was young, about 23 years old, as an image ed editor for a Japanese cultural magazine um, called Contemporary Eye, which was a kind of left-leaning uh, cultural journal. And it's here that he met the leading Japanese photographer of the period, whose work I'm sure many of you know, Shomai Tamatsu. Um, I haven't got time to talk about Tomatso, but Tomatso basically introduces this much more subjective, much more lyrical form of documentary practice that kind of breaks with the documentary realism in Japan um, in the 1950s. He's very concerned with social themes, with the American occupation of Japan at this time, also with the dramatic process of urbanization uh, within, um, within the Japanese environment, particularly within Tokyo. Um, Japanese is, Japan is modernizing rapidly during the 1960s. Uh, particularly under American influence, and uh, Tomatsu makes that his subject. Two of his great photo books, I'm a King from 1972, and his Oshinjuku book. And just to give you another sense of how sort of politicized a lot of his projects were, um, this is uh, a book, Okinawa, 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 uh, which dates, I think, from 1969, about the American occupation of Okinawa, and in particular the fact that the Americans were flying um, B-52 bombers out from Okinawa over uh, North Vietnam. Now, Tomatsu supposedly gave Nakahira a camera, and um, I'm always a bit suspicious of these kind of origin stories, but it seems in this case it may have been true. And Nakahira began a really intense period of investigation of the character of photography as a practitioner around 1964, 1965, but also, I think, very significantly as a theorist and critic, as well as a historian. At this time, Nakahira met the theorist Koji Taki. Um, we'll come back to Taki later in this lecture. And together they began work as part of a bigger curatorial team on a really exhaustive um, study of Japanese photography, which resulted in this exhibition um, called 100 Years of Photography, the History of Japanese Photographic Expression, which was shown in 1968 at a department store in Tokyo. And it, this was an immensely significant kind of opening up of Japanese photography. Um, there were about well over 1,600 photographs shown in this exhibition. It had been produced by a curatorial team of 13 or 14 people. And the story is that they looked at half a million photographs in order to make this exhibition. And you get a sense, even in this installation shot, of the way that the photographers document within the history of Japan uh, is very important for them. So Nakahira's practice was really intensely, historically and theoretically informed in a very kind of brief period of activity. And this in turn is part of a much wider uh, debate um, within Japanese culture about the nature uh, of the image. The Japanese had a very sophisticated conception of the mediated or technical image in the 1960s, again, I think far more significant than anything in Western Europe. And it was a densely intermedial culture. And I think this is another vital point when understanding and thinking about Japanese photography at this time. And all this led in 1968 to the production of the famous Provoke uh, magazine, which appeared in just three issues between November 1968 um, and August 1969. It involved, first of all, four photographers, Nakahira, Taki, who I mentioned, Takehiko Okada, who invited Nakahira to Paris, Yutaka Takanashi, and then from the second issue, joined um, by Daido Moriyama. These are from Provoke 1, a couple of pictures by Taki. You can see that still at this point, Provoke is kind of socially engaged. These are uh, photographs that relate to the Japanese protest movement. And this is an installation of Provoke that I did last year at the Photo Museum in Winterthur. Some of you may have seen this exhibition in Paris. It moved there. It was a much more theatrical presentation in Paris. We had a kind of slightly more rational presentation in Winterthur. There you see Provoke 2. Provoke three on the wall. We pinned a facsimile on the wall to give a sense of the materiality of the magazine. And you can see in the tray, Provoke one, two, and three. And actually on the wall here are some photographs um, by Tomatsu. Um, and this was a very intensely politicized uh, context. And one of the arguments about Provoke is that it was densely informed 
um, by the Japanese protest movement, which was very significant in Japan. It began in 1960 in response to the American occupation of Japan, specifically in relation to the signing of a security treaty um, with the United States. And it found a really vital expression in photographic form, particularly through the production of these Japanese protest uh, books. I've seen about 80 of these protest books. Um, I think um, there are probably a few more published between about 1960, 1975, and 1978. And I'm just very quickly, I, I, I can't linger on this topic, um, but I just want to run very quickly through so you get a sense of them. This is one of the very early photo books by Hiroshi Hamaya called A Record of Anger <coughs> and Sadness, which charts the progression of the demonstrations in Tokyo uh, against the signing of the Security Treaty in 1960. He's evolving out of a kind of reportage-based practice, but quickly begins to develop uh, a form of photography, which I think is very different in these kind of very interesting blur perspectival views, these strong kind of gravure um, presentations that kind of bleed to the edge uh, of the pamphlet. Another early photo book, uh, protest book, which I like, um, called uh, Rope, Ladder and Iron Helmet, which dates from 1960, which is the story of the occupation uh, of a publishing house uh, in Tokyo. One of the things about these books is they were meant to be instructive. They were meant to kind of instruct the participants in the struggle about how that struggle uh, should progress. This is one of the great spreads from it, where you see this kind of bespectacled white-collar worker sort of screaming out in rage against the bosses and actually this forehead here which you see in the bottom is the forehead of the owner uh, of uh, the publishing house. Um, Kazuo Kitai's great book Resistance Taiko from uh, 1964. Kitai's 23 years old when he produces this book and it's about the demonstration uh, in opposition to um, an American nuclear submarine arriving on Japanese soil. And uh, Kitai in particular is known for these very innovative uh, spreads that he produces. He's using damp film that's stored in kind of damp and humid conditions, scratches on the surface of the negative to create this remarkable kind of visual complexity in relation to protest. Um, and I think, you know, what, what you get from these books is a strong sense of the kind of libidinal energy that is involved in um, protest and kind of revolutionary movement in Japan at this moment. They really are remarkable books produced by students, very young people mainly, um, working with very um, primitive photographic equipment, photographing at night. It was important, I think, that the demonstrators were often anonymous in these photographs because the police were very interested in finding out who they were. And the other aspect of these photo books, which is very important and needs emphasis, is that they're very tactical. Japanese protest is intensely tactical, very, very different from the kind of spontaneous eruptions that you see in Western protests. And these books really record the tactical operations of the struggle. This is a photograph, but it shows the kind of mapping of the uh, protest against the police in Tokyo. Extremely violent confrontations. It makes Paris in 1968 look like a tea party. And this was a key ethic for the Japanese protesters, that they would take these bamboo staves, known as gababo, and they would charge the tanks and the police vehicles. And it was a kind of moral point that they were making, that this violence um, could be conducted with limited means against the far greater power of the state. Uh, and they also, this uh, the book produced by students, um, one of the things that the police did was use illegal gases on the students, and the students then went and tested these gases on mice and rats, and there was a book produced that showed the results of these experiments um, on the mice. Uh, and this is a, a later book from Okinawa. Generally, as the protest, mo the protest movement kind of peaks in 68 and 69, and as it recedes, the photography again becomes um, a little bit more conservative. But you see here the figure of the B-52 bomber. Uh, I think I read somewhere that there were 350 sorties a month flying out from Okinawa over North Vietnam, wreaking havoc over North Vietnam, and this kind of overshadowing of Japanese sovereignty uh, by um, American imperialism is a very strong aspect uh, in these photographs. So this then was the context of Provo magazine, which became best known for this famous stylistic innovation, which I'm sure some of you have read about, known as grainy, blurry, and out of focus. And these are photographs uh, by Nakahira uh, from Provoke 2 of the urban environment, where you get this sense of kind of obfuscation, obscurity. He's very interested in the way that light plays off different surfaces and the kind of flare of light uh, against um, shadow and darkness. 
So in this way, so the story goes, that provoked photographers managed to unveil the transformation of a very politicized urban environment in Japan during um, the late 1960s, Provoke 3, and, Alayla, and work by Mori Arma. However, as is becoming clear in recent research, and I've been talking about research that's been published in the last year or so, Provoke was also a highly theoretical project, shaped fundamentally, although I also think antagonistically, by the ideas of Koji Taki in collaboration with Nakahira. That theory is quite complex, and I can't go into it in depth, but it involves two fundamental ideas, and these ideas are important, so I just want to mention them. First of all is a deep suspicion of the ability of the photographic image to reveal anything about the world. This is very characteristic of Japanese photography during the 1960s. And I think this originates in Taki's experience of Japanese propaganda during World War II and results in a conception of photography as fundamentally compromised by an ideological environment of conformism and coercion. Thus, according to Taki, ruling state and capitalist interests enjoy hegemonic control over all public forms of material culture in Japan, with the result that the meaning of any individual object is always co-opted to serve those interests. And this is one of Taki's photographs from Provoke 1. The second aspect of Taki's theory, which I think was also very influential for Nakahira, draws on Roland Barthes' structuralist theory from the 1960s. So this is the kind of early theory of Barthes in relation to the image um, before the publication of S.Z. And in particular, this idea that Barthes develops that the photograph is an image without a code. And this idea of the codeless photograph became very important for the provoked photographers. Barthes basically argues that the kind of codeless photograph transmits its meaning sublinguistically. And this is a feature, I think, fundamentally of the photographic document. It was something that Nakahira and Taki discovered when they did all this work on, docu on, the, image of, uh, on the documentary image or the document um, during uh, their research on the 1968 exhibition. It's an image that's neutral, it's an image that's accidental, and it's an image that, as far as possible, erases the creative intervention of the photographer in favour of the automatic action of the camera. It has the semiotic power to dispel the illusory reality of um, shrouding the manipulation of the image in society. Another image uh, by Taki from Provoke. And it's this search for a codeless photography, a photography that is kind of extra or non-linguistic, that underpins the practice of Provoke. So for Nakahira and Taki, at least, their imagery provides unmediated experience of a pure or absolute Reality, and they felt their photography was constituting a new language outside of traditional ideas of language. At least that was the theory. Now, the problem with this, as Nakahira very quickly worked out, is that provoked photography was itself heavily coded and was very quickly appropriated by others. And there's this great story about Nakahira suddenly realizing that the Japanese railway company had appropriated the kind of grainy, blurry, out-of-focus style for some of its advertising. At that moment, he realized that this idea of the codeless image was uh, pretty, uh, was, well, complete nonsense. However, he did remain attached to the idea of photography penetrating a compromised reality, and he pursued this idea um, in his first great photo book, and I think this really is one of the great books in the history of photography, For a Language to Come, published in November 1970. So the title is indicative. He's still very attached to this idea of photography forging a new language. And this is the slipcase on the left and the cover of the book on the right. Here we see in this book, I think, an even greater attention to urban landscape aesthetics, a dramatic, perhaps dystopian vision of the city in which the photographer ranges across the urban landscape with his camera in search of those moments that penetrate con conventional vision and the social relations that sustain it. So this isn't just an edgy or subjective urban photographic style as it's so often been interpreted but I think something much more profound it's a kind of unremitting attempt to force the camera to penetrate an opaque reality ordered symbolically by reactionary power and so again we have this highly politicised context in which these photographers are all working so now I think we can turn to circulation um, and further development uh, in Nakahira's thought and practice. The circulation is an impossibly difficult work to show on PowerPoint. I was saying to Jonathan yesterday, it re it's really a, an anti-PowerPoint work. 
and I've been struggling with how to do this. So what I've decided to do is just let it roll. So circulation is now going to roll for the rest of this lecture. It's going to circulate, if you like, and hopefully as I speak, my words will kind of intersect with some of the images in an interesting way. We'll see how that works out. Now, there are two fundamental aspects uh, or developments in Nakahira's thinking, each uh, rejecting and retaining aspects of provoked theory that I want to mention to you here because they're both very important. First is the ideal of the intervention. And Nakahira was invited very explicitly to make an intervention uh, at the Biennale in Paris, resulting in what he described as, quote, the rejection of the one-sided form of exchange between artist and viewer. So I think he's very deliberately here turning his back on the idea of the photographer putting a work on the wall and the viewer looking at it. He's trying to rethink that idea. Circulation was to resemble a performative rather than an expressive act, challenging modernist autonomy and opening the artwork up to the collaboration of others, and especially, I think, in its integration into a wider environment. And this is a very key idea for Nakahira. In fact, if you look at some of the installation shots from circulation, you see he draws a kind of plan for the work, and part of that plan is that the work should spill out of the Biennale Hall into the wider environment. In fact, the Biennale was staged in a park, in a botanical gardens, and he wanted circulation to kind of flow uh, into the space of the garden. In fact, Nakahira developed a very sophisticated definition of intervention. I just very quickly want to read it to you. He described it, quote, as a shared zone of mutual relations of mediation through interventions within the space between the artist and an indeterminate number of people who can see or touch the work. It's a very nice definition, a shared zone of mutual relations of mediation through interventions within the space between the artist and an indeterminate number of people who can see or touch the work. This is the definition of the photographic interface, the human definition, if you like. The idea that people can actually intervene in the work, can touch it, can perhaps even reorder it. Now, his arguments here are, I think, very close to the precepts of the anti-institutional avant-garde. Again, it's fairly common to hear these kind of arguments at this time. And I think particularly this very utopian idea of shattering the boundaries um, of the aesthetic, you know, bringing art out of the world of the art uh, of the art institution into the world, uh, into ordinary life, if you like. And there are other aspects of Japanese culture that relate very strongly to that that I haven't got time to talk about. High Red Center, for example, performance group, Monoha, um, theater directors like Su Shuji Teriyama, who are kind of enacting their performances in the urban environment. Second, in circulation, Nakahira is particularly concerned to challenge the expression of any kind of core meaning through the individual self. This is very important to him. There's no direct relation for him between self, world, and artwork. This is another definition of his idea of interface. It's kind of anti-individualism. Specifically, he develops the idea of his images creating what he terms a second reality. Very important term for Nakahira. And this is an attempt to erase or at least erode creative subjectivity. And I think this relates back to some of Taki's arguments about the photograph being an image without a code. Photographs can no longer be the expression of the individual artist, but rather are marked by, quote, the complete eradication of any personal meaning concealed within a single photograph. As Nakahira claims, my photography discarded its status as my possession and relinquished its existence as a work of art exclusive only to myself. I want to return to this idea, because it's an incredibly important idea in thinking about this, um, this artwork. But for now, I just want to think of circulation as somehow channeling reality while simultaneously downgrading the creative consciousness of the artist. So with these propositions in mind, we can ask the question, what is, or perhaps better, how is circulation? And I think it's difficult to say. It's been variously described as a kind of performance piece, as an installation piece, as a kind of process or systems-based artwork, but maybe none of those are quite adequate. Looking at the installation shots, I've been fascinated by the manner in which circulation arranges or brings together photographs in a very deliberate way. And to that extent, I want to suggest that circulation is perhaps best described as an assemblage. Here I borrow the term assemblage, and I admit rather opportunistically, from Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, the French post-structuralist theorists who made use of the term in their book A Thousand Plateaus, Mille Plateaux, uh, that was published in 1980. 
The French term for assemblage is agencement, and it carries a rather different meaning from its English translation, less a gathering or bringing together of things than an arrangement or layout of heterogeneous elements. For Deleuze and Guattari, above all else, the assemblage is an attack on the idea of unity, a rejection of unity in favour of multiplicity and a rejection of essence in favour of the contingency and intensity of events. The assemblage is, if you like, a fragmentary whole, a proliferation of meanings, a process of becoming that refuses to reduce its elements to discrete processes. Thus circulation as assemblage combines, mixes and aggregates images whilst refusing the unity of the completed artwork. Circulation is more like a machine than a creative whole and can be constantly daily reconfigured, reprogrammed, if you like. Circulation has no frame. It reaches out into the external world. It quite literally, as we've seen, falls into the world. It recombines its elements, ever open to addition or subtraction, without ever becoming complete. Circulation is a singular event, but made up of other events, days, individual photographs, groups of photographs, a network of relations and elements that change in a kind of reciprocal feedback loop, including the intervention of the viewer. Intriguingly, Deleuze and Guattari also argue that the personae involved in an assemblage, the artist and the people looking at the work, do not transcend the assemblage, but are somehow imminent to it. The artist is neither external to the assemblage, nor does he define it in advance. And I think this is a notion that's very compatible with the idea of circulation embodying a kind of second reality. Circulation as assemblage then, I think, emancipates and recombines the image. And it does this in a very particular context. And I just, as I move towards a conclusion here, just want to pick very quickly on two of the contexts in which circulation is shown. The first, obviously, is the context of the city and the wider economic moment of the early 1970s, um, which I'm sure those of you who lived through that will remember as very dramatic. I remember as a child the lights going out in London because of the, uh, the uh, uh, electric, uh, electricity cuts. Nakahira, as we've seen, brought to Paris a very profound understanding of urban transformation and the role of the image in this. He had experienced an image politics of the most intense kind in Japan during the 1960s. And I think we see in Japan a process, a transition from an industrial to a post-industrial economy, marked by the expansion of the commodity relation to mediate all levels of society. Capital, more so than ever before, becomes circulation. It penetrates culture more extensively, not least through the media, marketing and services industries, all of which expand dramatically during the 1960s in Japan, uh, but also in Western Europe. The city itself becomes a space for the enhanced realisation of value and therefore a site of struggle. And there are all kinds of people at this time writing about this. I love that book by Henri Lefebvre called The Urban Revolution that was published in 1970, in which he quite explicitly argues that the left should forget about the kind of factory as the site of stru struggle, but the city becomes the site of struggle because of this process of the kind of expansion of capital through circulating through the urban environment. There are other writers like Castells who are saying similar things. The Italian uh, autonomous movement are talking about the rise of the social factory, which is a kind of social space beyond or kind of extending the factory. Uh, into daily life. These actually are all massively significant arguments for the world that we live in today, I think. Nor should we forget that it was in August 1971 that Richard Nixon closed the so-called gold window, marking the beginning of the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement of dollar-gold convertibility, ushering in the period of volatile, free-floating currency exchange that has become so crucial to financialization. Circulation, the artwork then, I think, mediates a really profound transformation, and it's an incredibly responsive artwork. There are a few artworks from this period that are so responsive. And in fact, if you look closely at these images, many of the things that I've mentioned to you are explicitly articulated. Um, there are images in here that talk very directly about the changing exchange rate environment in relation to the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Having said this, I also think that Nakahira is at times a little distanced from the transformations of Paris, and I guess this isn't really a surprise because he's only really there for a month or so. If there's a Japanese machinic eros at work in circulation, it seems oddly distanced from Paris' newest 
machines. And I'm thinking here in particular of the building of the Boulevard Périphérique, the great ring road that transformed the fabric of the city during the 1960s and that was eventually inaugurated uh, in 1973. The, the Périphérique doesn't appear uh, in this selection of images at all. More than anything, the periphery revealed that circulation was becoming value productive in its own terms. There was no barrier it couldn't destroy, including working class neighbourhoods. I'm thinking, for example, about the demolition of Upper Belleville um, in the late 1960s. I have a very personal connection to this because I was born in Paris at this time in the 19th arrondissement, which was kind of um, under pressure from the periphery at this time. If Nakahira understood brilliantly that circulation was the core work of the city, his image of Paris nonetheless remains, I think, attached to its older, perhaps even modernist, imaginary. I'd be very interested afterwards in hearing from you what you think of these photographs as a kind of representation of the city. A second point I want to make relates to circulation's image politics. Certainly the work embodies Nakahira's concern to overturn a kind of late modernist photography. This is a work which is partly about photography and overturning a certain kind of photographic practice. Um, previously he'd written about um, people like Robert Frank um, and Henri Cartier-Bresson and the, the need to move beyond them. William Klein was the hero uh, for Nakahira for all kinds of reasons that we can perhaps uh, discuss afterwards. But I also think that circulation attempts to engage a mode of image circulation to counter media spectacle and for me this is a profoundly intermedial work it's a real mistake just to see this as a work about photography it seems to me that it's lodged in that kind of intermedial space which is so crucial to understanding Japanese culture at this time like other Japanese artists in the early 1970s Nakahiro was deeply concerned about the counter-revolutionary function of television seen in the neutralization of politics and the erasure of political subjectivities. People, I think, were looking for explanations for the defeat of the movement in 68 and the kind of rise of a highly mediatized news culture uh, was part of that explanation. To that extent, we might read circulation, as I think others have also done, as a kind of hijacking of dominant media flows. And we need to remember this was the period of hijacking. Um, they're also dominant, uh, they're also Japanese terrorist groups engaged in hijacking actions at this time. There are two points I want to emphasize here. First is the form of circulation itself. It's consciously kind of chaotic, unfinished character, which is, I think, a literal deformation of modernism in photography. So, for example, we see the very dramatic breakdown of the modernist grid in this work, you know, and the conscious kind of curling of the photographs, which emphasize the materiality of the object in a very self-conscious way, and create these kind of essential interfaces between the photographs. This is what worries me about PowerPoint. When I show you these, I kind of misrepresent what these images were in circulation. They were curling, they were creating their own interfaces in a very central way between kind of groups of images. And I think this is all a kind of very new way of thinking about the presentation of the photograph. I think we see it also in the anti-formalism of the images themselves with their disorienting close-ups or middle-distance views which don't so much penetrate into space as observe it by looking on. And there are kinds of lots of drive-by images here. There seem to be a lot of images taken from scooters or cars. And we know, of course, that Nakahira is frantically commuting because his dark room was in the center of Paris. The exhibition hall was in the eastern suburbs of Paris. So he was spending all his time like traveling one way or another. There's a conscious banality and externality in Nakahira's photography, which also relates to a form of landscape aesthetics in Japanese film at this time, known as Chiron. I'm thinking of those of you that know anything about Japanese cinema, films like A.K. Serial Killer, uh, which attempt to de-spectacularize landscape and also visual politics. And broadly, the argument was that the kind of protest movement of the 60s had become very spectacularized, and artists were looking at ways to kind of de-spectacularize um, that kind of visual politics. And I think we've come some distance here, certainly from protest photography. Uh, Nakahira turns his back on that, but perhaps also from the aesthetic strategies that Fire Provoke magazine. Second, I think Nakahira is attempting to displace the dominant scopic regime by creating a form in which viewers themselves are enjoined to construct an encoded visual reality. He realized, I think, and I think this is a very important point, that the penetration of the social fabric by commercial images means that the agency of one's own vision becomes a point of political departure. Circulation aspires to create a new form of subjective vision that somehow isn't 
individualized. It's a kind of post-individualistic way of seeing, I think, which functions rather as a network, a kind of connective tissue that takes viewers beyond themselves and towards the outside world. Circulation manages to de-individualize subjectivity and de-objectify the world, and in a manner that is still thoroughly embodied, and I think the embodied nature of this work is also very significant. Intriguingly, this is close to what Deleuze and Guattari called a nomadic assemblage, as opposed to a capitalist assemblage, a qualitative transformation in which all the elements of the assemblage enter into an open feedback loop and in which all agents, ideally at least, participate equally. Circulation proposes, I think, a qualitative change in our image world through a trans-individual visual politics of connectivity, and there are all kinds of echoes here, I think, for the present moment. Now, as you may have guessed from some of my language, I think that there is something deeper going on here, that there's a kind of political unconscious at work in circulation. And as my title suggests, I want to describe this as an operative or cybernetic unconscious. And I want to be clear here, I mean, I'm not, it's in my title, but um, I don't think there's a kind of dramatic transition from the optical unconscious to the operative unconscious. The, op the optical unconscious is this idea that is embedded in the work, the theory of Walter Benjamin, that photographs kind of reveal things that the human eye can't see. And this is a very important idea for Taki and Nakahiro when they worked on the history of Japanese uh, photography in their exhibition. Um, and I don't think, I think this idea is still important for Nakahira. He's not kind of displacing it entirely, but I think he's doing something else with the image. He's trying to put it into a, a process, a, a system of movement that might be described as operative or cybernetic. And I guess most of you know now what I mean when I'm talking about cybernetics. I'm talking here about this kind of growing post-war industry of information control that relates to a kind of whole range of technologies and practices including warfare, cybernetics was very important for missile guidance systems, broadcasting, a kind of classic cybernetic apparatus, the media and of course eventually computing and we need to remember this is the moment when computing was becoming much more personal, well not personal but social. Uh, my father w worked as an aircraft engineer in Paris during the 1960s and I used to love the stories as a child when he told me when, when the, uh, when the, uh, when the um, calculator appeared in the office and at that point, it was kind of wheeled around the office on a huge uh, tea tray. But this is the moment when it happens in the kind of late 60s and early 1970s. And I think the cybernetic relates compellingly to many of circulation's key features. And I just want to list some of those. The relation of the single photograph to a larger system or network of signification. An engagement with process and haphazard visualization as a route to knowledge rather than formal or indeed formless precision. A self-reflexive framework, a certain valorization of analysis, displacing, if not entirely replacing, indexicality. A performative logic opened up to other agents and elements in a perpetual feedback loop. And a kind of flowing, interactive interface with the city. I could go on, but all these, it seems to me, are core features of the cybernetic. Finally, I think this also helps explain Nakahira's notion of the second reality he wishes to create, a human-machine interface or entanglement in which the photographer becomes a kind of cyborg. And I recently went back and I reread Nakahira's writings about this work, and I realized that he talked himself about taking these photographs as, quote, running around like a mouse on a treadmill. And this is a kind of classic trope of animal-machine interface. Vision, even if it still includes the artist, becomes more automated. In short, vision becomes a kind of auto-poetic process. So what can we say about circulation by way of conclusion? First, to return to one of my questions I posed at the beginning of this lecture about periodization. Circulation seems to me to be a work that is on the cusp. This, I think, is one of the reasons why it's so interesting between Fordism and post-Fordism. That transition from a relatively stable Keynesian compact between capital and labor to our time of flexible accumulation, enhanced privatization, financialization, and an offensive against the working class, which if your lives are anything like mine is becoming increasingly part of all our lives today. Circulation is also on the cusp, I think, between modernism and postmodernism. Marked by growing concern with process, I think the production of the photograph increasingly becomes a kind of pretext in this work. 
and also fundamentally with the problem of mediation. The city, Paris, is no longer represented in photography, but rather realised through the photographic artwork as interface. Circulation preempts what Deleuze later famously described as the society of control. A move from the time when, quote, disciplinary man was a discontinuous producer of energy towards the time when, quote, the man of control is undulatory, in orbit, in a continuous network. And we could perhaps say that Nakahira is one of the first photographers of control. Circulation, it seems to me, is contradictory. A product, on the one hand, of what might be described as Fordist speed, in which the image is laboriously crafted by the sleepless photographer working alone at night. There's a sense in which Nakahiri is kind of runs his own sort of personalised production line. And on the other hand, the fabrication of a visual simultaneity in which the techniques of montage or the modernist grid give way to an aesthetic of networked relationality. The photographer makes his initial appearance, if you like, as the bio-informational subject of neoliberal capitalism. This is, I think, the real contradiction as Frederick Jameson might put it, that frames circulations operative and conscious, an underlying subtext, subtext that is not quite fully there yet. Finally, I want to conclude with the observation that Nakahira intended circulation as a work of disalienation, an attempt to subvert the commodification of the image, the bureaucratic taming of the artist, and the institutionalization of art. And I have a quote that I just want to read to you that he wrote after this process. I'm going to just see if I can flick through these to get the quote because it's such an important statement by Nakahira. As you can see, my timing was a bit out. This interesting flow and the movement of uh, liquids is very interesting. It's something that appears a lot in Japanese uh, performance art at this time. It obviously has a relationship to the work of the photographer in the dark room as well. We're nearly at the end now. see these very kind of close-up images. All kinds of echoes here in, of previous work that was done in Japan in the 60s, transportation cars. Very interesting clocks, they appear a lot. Um, okay, we're nearly there. Okay, this is the quotation that I want to read to you. This is what Nakahira writes shortly after he leaves the Biennale. Most importantly, the essential question that has emerged from this is how to escape from the art exhibition as institution, art as institution, and the artist as institution. Without planning our escape from these, let there be no mistake. Representations of any kind will inevitably be reduced to a style, a mere fashion, and ultimately a commodity. Although there is no concrete means of escape, in the very least we can say that without taking a step in that direction, everything will end up as fruitless labour quite literally. Now, this is what Frederick Jameson, an important essay about Hans Hacker, later described as the neo-avant-garde's homeopathic solution. And the homeopathic solution is a kind of limited resolution to the problems of the commodified image. Um, and Jameson poses the problem this way. He says it's how to struggle within the world of the simulacrum, within the world of the commodified image, by using the arms and weapons specific to that world which are themselves very precisely simulacra. Nakahira, it seems to me, conceived of circulation as a partial solution to that problem, a hijacking of the simulacrum. But as Nakahira also clearly realised, taking ever greater doses of the homeopathic poison was never really a solution. In Paris, he felt confident about the installation of circulation, and it restored his energies for a while after the collapse of Provoke. But the well-being fostered by his homeopathic cultural politics would prove short-lived. In 1973, Nakahira destroyed most of his work, including the vast majority of his negatives, in a bonfire on a beach near his home. It was an act disavowing circulation's disruptive potential, and it was an expression in the face of a victorious image capitalism of a radical doubt about photography that never really left him. Thank you very much.
we have time for questions? Yeah, I think we have there's a few questions before we go. Will that be published someplace so we can read it? Um, a, a much shorter version of this is coming out very soon in the Brazilian photo magazine Zoom, which is published um, by the Institute uh, uh, Morales Salas in, uh, in uh, Sao Paulo. So that will come out soon. Um, I would like to write a, a fuller academic version of this up and probably will do some. I feel I've been working a lot with translators because I don't read Japanese and I feel very hampered by that. Uh, Nakahira's writing is extremely significant and I would like to be able to read more of it. Although having said that, a Tokyo publisher is about to publish a big volume of his writings in translation. So I'm hoping that his work will become more accessible and thereafter. And the question based on, based on the last quote there about the descending in the style. Uh, which, I, I, thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk. Um, I'm really delighted to be introduced to this work. In terms of the aesthetics of the work, how deliberately think the artist was, was it, is it, because I love the fact that the photographs just seem to be evidence of his decision to use, to, to take a picture, and then whatever happens, happens, and the, the kind of ephemera and, and disregard for the object, which I love. Um, but in terms of the aesthetics, and that sort of black and white grainy, how deliberate is that, or is it just purely functionary, do you think, in terms of that was what they had to use? Yeah, I mean, Nakahiro would like to say it, that it was a functional procedure. Yeah. And he is really trying to erode his subjectivity, his, his kind of creative subjectivity in this process. You know, he is trying to become a kind of automated um, kind of extension of the camera, I think. This is very much what this work is trying to do. Um, but of course, you know, um, there are many decisions involved even in taking these very normal photographs. I mean, it's interesting because... Uh, I've heard dealers say to me, th the problem is the photographs are terrible, you know. <laughs> um, but actually, that's the point, you know. That is the point. This, he's not trying to make Henri Cartier-Bresson's uh, decisive moments. He feels that in the wake of the slaughter in Vietnam, you can't do that, you know. And so, the, you know, the politics is in, in the image. The point is in the image. Um, and, of course, it's a code. Of course, he's, he thinks it isn't, but... You know, and it drives him to crisis. I mean, it does, you know, in 73, he burns his negatives. In 77, he has a tremendous breakdown. I mean, he's deeply, deeply affected by this problem. I, I, I was intrigued. You, you, you posed the question early on. No, you actually made a statement. You said that by the end of your presentation, we would probably understand what he would think about that re-showing of it in Chicago. Um, if you destroyed all the negatives, how the hell did they reshow it anyway? As well as what, what were they thinking, you know? Yeah, I mean, intriguingly, these negatives weren't destroyed. <laughs> and in fact, I mean, what interests me is that this stuff was all torn down at the end, um, he, partly because of this huge dispute he entered into. But actually, people were collecting these prints, and some of them are popping up on the market. Um, so... <laughs> So there was, I mean, why didn't he, why weren't those negatives destroyed? I don't know. To be honest, I don't know the answer to that. What he would have thought, the Chicago presentation, I leave to you. I mean, he hated institutions, um, and he felt this was a work of the moment. Um, he would n never have allowed this work to have been reinstalled during his lifetime. And, ha and I mean, it's funny because I gave a talk at the Art Institute when that work went up, and it was very hard talk because I felt that what I was saying was really actually radically criticizing what they did. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.